Lecture number six, Nibbana. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutasa. The Buddha says that he teaches only dukkha and the cessation of dukkha, suffering and the end of suffering. In the talks given so far, we've dealt primarily with the first side of the Dhamma, with the problem of suffering. However, the truth of suffering is not the final word of the Buddha's teaching. It is only the starting point, the first noble truth, not the whole of the Dhamma. The whole of the Dhamma has to be found by examining all four noble truths. So far, we've explored the negative side of the truth, the truth of suffering and its cause. In this talk and in the following talks, we'll deal with the other side, the positive side, with the third and fourth noble truth. But before doing so, it's important to understand why the Buddha starts his teaching with the truth of suffering. He starts with suffering because his teaching is designed for a particular end. It is designed to lead us to liberation. In order to do this, the Buddha must give us a reason to seek liberation. Normally, we aren't aware of the problematic nature of our existence. We live in a world of delusion. We see things as being pleasurable, attractive, permanent. We take our personalities to be a self. We live seeking pleasure, seeking to gratify and bolster the ego. We think only of how to maximize our enjoyment and our personal status. In this way, we get lost in the world of finite concerns. We get swept away by time, the current of time. We get sunk in the dark mass of ignorance. We do not realize that our lives are pervaded by dukkha. We don't see the pain and suffering, the impermanence, the insubstantiality surrounding us on all sides. To lead us out of dukkha, to bring us to the true state of peace, the peace of deliverance, the Buddha first has to alert us to the danger. He has to make us see the problem, the peril. He has to arouse in us the sense of urgency. His position is somewhat like someone trying to save a man caught unawares in a burning house. The man doesn't realize his house is on fire. He's living there, enjoying himself, watching television, playing and laughing. To get him to come out, the first thing that we have to do is to let him know that his home is on fire. So in the same way, the Buddha announces in the first noble truth that our house is on fire. Our lives are burning with old age, sickness and death. Our minds are flaming with the fires of greed, hatred, and delusion. Then when we become aware of the trouble, when we're ready to seek a way to release, then the Buddha can show us the possibility of freedom. Freedom from dukkha, from suffering, can only be attained by cutting off its cause. The principal cause of suffering, the Buddha says, is craving. Tanha, the desire for personal gratification, the desire for existence, the desire for a world of sight, sound, smells, taste, touch sensations, and ideas. And since the cause of dukkha is craving, the key to reaching the end of dukkha is to eliminate craving. And therefore, the Buddha explains the third noble truth as consisting in the extinction of craving. He says, to quote the text, What now is the noble truth of the cessation of suffering? It is the complete fading away and cessation of craving. It's forsaking and abandonment, liberation and detachment from it. 
This noble truth of the cessation of suffering has two dimensions, the psychological dimension and the philosophical dimension. We'll deal with them briefly, each in turn. First, at the psychological level, we find that unhappiness, content, or suffering results from the tension between desire and the lack of the thing desired. We desire something, an object, a person, a particular situation. We do not have it, therefore we feel dissatisfied. We desire to hold on to something forever, and when we think of losing it, then we feel afraid, we feel worry and anxiety. And when we lose what we have, then we feel sorrow and grief. Thus all suffering, all pain and dissatisfaction comes about from this conflict between desire and reality. Now there are two possible approaches to overcoming the unhappiness that results from this tension. One is to obtain the object of desire, to secure possession of it. The other is to eliminate the desire. In both cases, the tension, the conflict is removed and the unhappiness is replaced by pleasure or satisfaction. Now, usually we adopt the first alternative. We try to obtain the object of desire, and when we do so, we feel happy. Thus, we conclude that happiness comes from satisfying our desires. But the kind of happiness that results from satisfying our desires is very tenuous if we examine it carefully we find that it's unreliable, insecure. First of all, it depends on getting things outside ourselves. It depends on externals. And when we don't get the things we want, we become unhappy. We feel that we don't feel contentment in ourselves. And then in the second place, this kind of happiness requires the permanence of the objects of desire. But these things that we obtain are always impermanent. And when we're separated from them, then we become unhappy. Therefore, even in the midst of happiness, in the midst of pleasure, we remain vulnerable to suffering. And so our state of happiness and pleasure, if we examine it, we find that it's really illusory, really a concealed or potential form of dukkha. The Buddha, in his teaching, reverses this common assumption that underlies all of our usual activity, the assumption that happiness can be found by satisfying our desires. He points out that true happiness is to be achieved by taking the other approach, the opposite approach. This approach is to eliminate the desire. If we eliminate the desire, then our, our mind remains satisfied, content, and happy, no matter what our external situation might be. We can see this to a limited extent in our daily life, how all the worry, concern, clinging, and discontent that might build up around our desire for a certain object, how all of this mental unhappiness falls away drops away as soon as we drop the desire, the craving for that object. But the Buddha says that the same immediately visible principle can be carried all the way through to the point of completion, that it's possible to totally uproot craving once and for all. And by uprooting all of our thirst and craving, all our blind desire, we attain a happiness, a contentment, an inner satisfaction that can never be destroyed, can never be disrupted. This is the cessation of suffering, the end of dukkha, visible here and now. But the end of dukkha has a deeper meaning even than this. We saw in the previous talk, in an earlier talk, 
that our craving leads us into clinging. We cling, and because of our clinging, we engage in patterns of action by which we build up karma. Then through our karma, we turn over and over again in samsara, the round of birth and death, moving through its different planes of existence, the heavenly world, the human world, the lower world. All these different planes of existence have their own kinds of dukkha, their own forms of suffering. Even the heavens are no final refuge. By achieving a heavenly rebirth, we can enjoy immensely long lives, great power, beauty, and bliss. But even those worlds, the life in those worlds comes to an end and can be followed by rebirth elsewhere and by more suffering. Thus, to reach final happiness, full freedom from suffering, we have to get free from the cycle of existence. And this comes by uprooting craving. When craving is eliminated, all clinging stops. Our actions no longer build up karma. And then the wheel of repeated becoming is brought to a halt. That is the state, the final deliverance, which is the aim of the Buddha's teaching. The state of final deliverance is called in Pali Nibbana. In Sanskrit, nirvana. The word nirvana or nibbana literally means the going out or extinguishing of a flame. And thus, used figuratively by the Buddha, it means the extinguishing of the flame of craving, the extinguishing of the fires of greed, hatred, and delusion. The Pali writers also take the word to have the meaning of escape from the forest, that is, escape from the forest of craving or from the forest of samsaric becoming. The state of Nibbana is the ultimate goal of the Buddhist path, the end and the consummation of the entire practice. The Buddha says that just as the waters of a river plunge into the ocean and merge with the ocean, so the spiritual path, the Noble Eightfold Path, plunges into Nibbana and merges with Nibbana. Now when we try to talk about Nibbana, we immediately come up against the problem that Nibbana is said to be beyond the range of speech and language. Nibbana is a super mundane state, a reality which is to be seen, realized, and experienced not a concept to be conceptualized or an idea to be discussed. Ultimately, Nibbana should be experienced and realized. However, to make known the nature of Nibbana, we have to resort to words, we have to speak about it. And therefore, this lecture becomes possible. <laughs> if we were to really give a very direct communication of the nature of Nibbana, we just have to stop the lecture at this point. But then those who are listening would be disappointed, so therefore I'll have to go on to speak to fill up the rest of the tape. Now the question comes up as to the nature of Nibbana, and especially the question is asked, does Nibbana signify only the extinction of the defilements and liberation from samsara, or does it signify some reality existing in itself? According to the Theravada school of Buddhism, which I see to be solidly grounded in the actual word of the Buddha, Nibbana is not only the destruction of defilement and the ending of samsara, but an actually existing reality, a reality which is transcendent to all the realms of phenomenal existence, to the entire empirical world, of mundane experience. There are certain reasons which can be offered in support of this view. Here, I don't wish to burden anybody with dry scholarship, but a look at the text at the suttas spoken by the Buddha can help clarify for us our idea of what Nibbana is. This part might be a little bit 
dry, but in a little bit at times difficult to follow. But I ask the listeners to try to follow it, even if they have to repeat the tape. In the suttas, we find that there are certain key words that the Buddha uses to designate existing realities. These we can call ontological terms, terms with an existential meaning. These key terms are the words dhamma, ayatana, datu, pada, and satcha. The words are given on the list of Pali terms. We'll explain these words briefly and then show how each of them is applied to Nibbana. First, we'll take the word Dhamma. We have dealt with this word and some of its more common meanings as the teaching of the Buddha, as the truth made known by the Buddha, and as the path that leads to the realization of truth. But this word Dhamma also has a more philosophical meaning. The word Dhamma signifies the basic actualities the existing realities, those things which bear their own natures independent of our thinking, of our conceptual processing of them. The dhammas are distinguished from conceptual entities, those things which do not exist in fact, but only as ideas or notions in the mind. Now, all the dhammas, the actual existences, are divided into two basic groups, the conditioned and the unconditioned, sankata and asankata. A conditioned dhamma is an actuality which has come into being through causes and conditions, something which arises through the working of various conditions. The conditioned dhammas include all the phenomena with which we are ordinarily familiar, these all fall into the five aggregates. So any conditioned dhamma is either a material form, a feeling, perception, a mental formation, or an act of consciousness. Now all the conditioned dhammas go through three phases of becoming. First there's the phase of arising, then finally a phase of falling away, cessation, and in between the two there is a phase called titasa anyatattan. I've mentioned this before. That is the changing of that which stands, the transformation of that which persists. That is, while the conditioned dhamma lasts, while it persists, it undergoes constant change. It doesn't remain static, but it undergoes transformation. It's in a ceaseless process of becoming. So the conditioned Dhamma has these three phases, arising, transformation, and falling away. Now in contrast to all of the conditioned Dhammas, there is the class of the unconditioned, which is much simpler. It contains only one actuality, that is Nibbana. In contrast to the conditioned, the unconditioned is not produced by causes and conditions. And then, in contrast to the conditioned, the unconditioned has the three opposite marks. That is, it has no arising, it has no falling away, and it undergoes no transformation. And the Buddha speaks distinctly of Nibbana as a Dhamma. He calls it the Supreme Dhamma, the Uttamang Dhamma. And he says in one sutra, he says, that of all Dhammas, conditioned and unconditioned, the most excellent Dhamma, the Supreme Dhamma, is Nibbana. So Nibbana is definitely referred to by this key ontological term of Buddhism, the word Dhamma. Another important ontological term used by the Buddha is ayatana. This word usually means realm, plane, or sphere. For example, the Buddha speaks about the different planes of existence as ayatanas. And he also speaks about the six sense faculties as the six ayatanas. In a famous passage from the text, the Udana, 
the Buddha also speaks about Nibbana as an ayatana. He says, he says, monks, there is a realm, tadati, tadayatanam, there is a realm where there is neither earth, water, heat, or air, or air. Neither the sphere of infinite space, the sphere of infinite consciousness, the sphere of nothingness, or the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception. That is the four formless realms. There is neither this world nor any other world, neither sun nor moon. This I call neither arising nor passing away, neither standing still nor being born nor dying. There is neither foothold there nor development nor any basis. This is the end of suffering. So we see that in this passage the Buddha speaks of Nibbana as an ayatana, a realm or sphere. It's a sphere where there is nothing at all that corresponds to our world of mundane common experience. And therefore it has to be described entirely by way of negative, as the negation of all finite properties. Another word frequently used in the Buddha's discourses is the word datu. This word most often means element. Thus, the Buddha speaks of the four dhatus, the four material elements, earth, water, heat, and, vib- and air. At other times, he speaks of 18 elements, the six sense organs, the six sense objects, and the six kinds of consciousness. But the Buddha also speaks of another dhatu, another element. He calls this the amata dhatu, that is, the deathless element. And this deathless element is Nibbana. Thus in one sutta, he speaks about a monk who has reached the highest level in the development of insight, where he's seeing all of the five aggregates as impermanent, as dukkha, and as insubstantial. Then when he reaches this climax of insight, his mind suddenly turns away from all conditioned dhammas, and he says that he focuses his mind upon the deathless element, and that with his mind focused on the deathless element, he reaches the destruction of the defilement. In another sutta, the Buddha speaks of the Nibbana Dhatu, the element of Nibbana, and he compares it to an ocean. He says that just as the great ocean remains at the same level, no matter how much water pours into it from from the rivers, it remains at the same height without increase or decrease. So the Nibbana element remains the same no matter whether many or few people attain Nibbana. If many people attain Nibbana, the Nibbana element doesn't grow fuller. If few attain, the Nibbana element doesn't become diminished. And the Buddha speaks quite concretely about seeing Nibbana, the deathless element, almost as though it were the object of an act of vision. In another sutta, he speaks of it as something that can be experienced by the body. It's an experience that's so vivid, so concrete and real, that it can be described as touching the deathless element with one's own body. The Buddha also speaks about Nibbana as a padda. The word padda means a state. And the Buddha calls Nibbana the Amitapada, the deathless state. Thus he says in the Dhammapada, better than living a hundred years without seeing the deathless state is living one day seeing the deathless state. Another word used in the text is Satya. This word means truth. Not truth as a statement, but truth as reality as an existing reality. There's a passage where the Buddha says, that which the ignorant take to be truth, that the noble ones, the Aryans, know to be false. That which the Aryans know to be true, that the ignorant regard as false. That which is of an imperishable nature, that is Nibbana, and that is the truth known by the Aryans. So here in this passage, 
that which the ignorant take to be true, to be real, is a self, an ego entity. And this the Aryans know to be false, since through their insight they have realized that all phenomena are without a self, that they're all insubstantial. And that which the noble ones know to be truth, that is Nibbana. And this the ignorant take to be false, an imaginary thing or a vain notion. But the noble ones, the Aryans, have seen Nibbana. They've known through direct experience that it is real, the one ultimate reality that's imperishable. In another sutta, the Buddha says, that which has a perishable nature, that is false. But that which is of an imperishable nature, namely Nibbana, that is truth. And then he says in the same sutta, that this is the supreme noble truth, Nibbana, which is of an imperishable nature. So all of these textual sources put together, I think, very clearly establish the view that Nibbana is an actual reality and not the mere destruction of defilement and cessation of existence. Then there's also another famous passage which I think also makes the matter very definitely clear. This is the passage in the Udana, where the Buddha says, addressing the monks, he says, Monks, monks, there is, there is an unborn, an unoriginated, an uncreated, an unconditioned. If there were not this unborn, unoriginated, uncreated, unconditioned, there would be no escape possible from the world of the born, the originated, the created, and conditioned. However, since there is an unborn, unoriginated, uncreated, unconditioned, therefore escape is possible from the world of the born, the originated, the created, the conditioned. The Buddha here is saying that if there were no unconditioned reality, there would be no escape possible from the round of birth and death. The round of birth and death would go on forever. There would be no way at all to put an end to it. But the Buddha adds the positive counterpart to it. He says that there is, that there already exists an unborn, unoriginated, uncreated, unconditioned. And therefore, it is possible for the mind to know the unconditioned, to realize the unconditioned, and by realizing the unconditioned to destroy the ignorance and craving which hold us in bondage and thereby make an end to the round of becoming and reach deliverance from birth and death, deliverance from the world of the born, originated, created, and conditioned. Now, since Nibbana is the precondition for this liberation to take place, since Nibbana must exist for it to be known and for liberation to take place. Therefore, it's evident that Nibbana cannot simply re be reduced to the destruction of the, of the defilement and liberation from the round. Those events are conditioned events. They occur in time, while Nibbana is unconditioned, without any origination, timeless. Now, one particular problem is sometimes raised over the statement that Nibbana is unconditioned. It said that it seems contradictory to say that Nibbana is unconditioned and yet by practicing the path you attain Nibbana. Doesn't this seem to make Nibbana something that's conditioned by the practice of the path, something that's produced by the path, doesn't Nibbana become an effect, something not unconditioned, not causeless? Here, the contradiction is only apparent. Nibbana itself, we have to make a distinction between Nibbana itself and the attainment of Nibbana. Nibbana itself is unproduced, unoriginated. It's always existent. But by following the path, by reaching enlightenment, 
you realize Nibbana. By practicing the path, you don't bring Nibbana into existence, but rather you discover something already existing, something always present. We can say that the attainment of Nibbana, the realization of Nibbana, is produced by the practice of the path. But this doesn't mean that Nibbana itself is brought into being by the path. We can illustrate this by an analogy. The city of New York is presently existing, and there are highways leading into New York from all over the country. By driving along the highway, you can reach New York and enter the city. We can say that New York itself is produced by traveling along the highway. Rather, the highway gives us entrance to New York. By traveling on the highway, we can enter New York. Similarly, the path leads to Nibbana. By following the path, you reach enlightenment, and that brings the realization of Nibbana. But Nibbana itself is not created by the path. Now we can consider some of the terms and expressions used in the text as designations for Nibbana. We can try to treat these a little systematically. First of all, as a precaution, we have to repeat what we already said, that the nature of Nibbana cannot be understood through words or expression, not even through a very thorough study of the text. This can only give us knowledge, book knowledge, but not the real understanding of Nibbana. To truly understand Nibbana, we have to understand it through actual experience, through realization. Words themselves can never adequately indicate the nature of Nibbana. However, in order to communicate some idea of the goal to which his teaching points, the Buddha had to resort to words and expressions, the conventional means of communication. And when he speaks of Nibbana, he uses two types of expressions. On the one hand, negative expressions. On the other, positive expressions. And to get an adequate idea of Nibbana, both types of expressions have to be considered in balance. The Buddha uses each type with a special purpose in mind. And if we don't take both types into account, we will come away with a one-sided picture of Nibbana. Sometimes the Buddha uses negative, ex negative expressions. The Buddha's purpose here is to emphasize the supramundane nature of Nibbana, its transcendental nature. From one angle, Nibbana is something which is completely above and beyond all the limited forms of the world. It can only be described by negations of the conditions of the world. Thus we find such, ex such expressions for Nibbana as we've dealt with already, the unconditioned, the unoriginated, the unborn, the imperishable, the unchanging, the unsupported, and so on. These terms all convey their meaning by a process of exclusion. That is, they negate some perceptible feature of conditioned phenomena in order to show that Nibbana is something entirely different and distinct from all conditioned states. But we shouldn't make the mistake some scholars make of seizing upon these negative terms and then taking Nibbana to be a state of annihilation or complete non-existence. To illustrate this error, the Buddhists speak of a certain parable or story of the story of the turtle and the fish. According to this story, there was once a turtle who lived in a lake with a group of fish. And one day, the turtle went for a walk on dry land he was away from the lake for a few weeks. And when he returned, he met some of the fish, and the fish asked him, Oh, Mr. Turtle, hello, how are you? We haven't seen you for a few weeks. Where have you been all this time? The turtle said, Oh, I was up by spending my, some time on dry land. The fish were a little puzzled, and they said, Taking a walk on dry land? What are you talking about? What is this dry land? Turtle tried to think of some expressions, how to explain. He was left speechless. And the fish started asking questions. They said, well, this dry land of yours, is it wet? The turtle said, no, it's not wet. 
Well, is it cool and refreshing? No, it's not cool and refreshing. Does it have waves and ripples? No, it doesn't have waves and ripples. Can you swim in it? No, you can't swim in it. So the fish said, well, it's not wet, it's not cool, you can't, if it has no waves, you can't swim in it. So this dry land of yours must be complete non-existent. Just an imaginary thing, nothing real at all. The turtle said, well, maybe so, and he left the fish and went for another walk on dry land. And so, to sum up, one method for making known the nature of Nibbana by means of negative expressions is to eliminate all the attributes of mundane conditioned phenomena to show that they are all incommensurate with the nature of Nibbana, to show that Nibbana utterly transcends all the attributes of mundane things. Another purpose behind the use of negative expressions is to show the desirability of reaching Nibbana, to indicate the benefits of attaining Nibbana. To this end, the Buddha uses a different set of negative expressions. Whereas the first set is rather abstract and metaphysical, this set is very concrete and experiential. Here the Buddha speaks of Nibbana primarily in terms of negating suffering. He holds up Nibbana as the cessation of suffering, Dukkha Niroda. Thus it becomes the ideal goal, the aim of all striving, since all beings desire to be free from suffering, to be secure and free from sorrow. Then the Buddha uses terms which negate particular forms of suffering. He calls it the cessation of old age and death, the unafflicted, the unoppressed, the sorrowless state, asoka, hadda, the fearless state, abhaya, the deathless state, amata. By using these terms like the cessation of suffering, the Buddha awakens in us the aspiration to attain Nibbana. Then once he's awakened this aspiration, the next step is to point out what has to be done to reach the goal, to show the work that we have to do to arrive at the end of suffering. And to make this plain, the Buddha describes Nibbana by terms negating the defilement negating the mental factors that keep us in bondage. Sometimes the defilements are summed up in the word craving or tanha, the cause of suffering. And so Buddha calls Nibbana the destruction of craving, tanhakaya. Sometimes the defilements are said to be the three, greed, hatred, and delusion. And so Nibbana is termed the destruction of greed, the destruction of hatred, the destruction of delusion. In other places, Nibbana is called this passion, the raga, the removal of thirst, the crushing of pride, the uprooting of conceit, the extinction of vanity, the eclipse of ignorance, and so on. These terms all show the work that has to be done to reach the end of suffering. They show the direction in which we have to move and the task we have to accomplish. To reach the goal of Nibbana, it is necessary to destroy greed, hatred, and delusion, to eradicate craving, to uproot conceit, to abandon ignorance. And so the three purposes behind the use of negative terminology by the Buddha, to sum up, is first, to show that Nibbana is transcendental, that it's utterly beyond all conditioned phenomena and quite distinct from them. Secondly, to show that Nibbana is desirable, that it's the end to all states of suffering. And third, to show that Nibbana is to be attained by eliminating the defilement, by uprooting all the unwholesome mental factors. Now, because the Buddha uses this negative terminology for Nibbana, some people are inclined to misapprehend it and take Nibbana to be a state 
of mere annihilation, a purely negative attainment. To exclude this misinterpretation, the Buddha also describes Nibbana in positive terms. Some of these terms emphasize in positive ways the desirability of Nibbana. Thus, Nibbana is called the unexcelled, the supreme, the final goal, the ultimate. All these terms hold up Nibbana as the highest ideal and ultimate aim of aspiration. Now, if these terms are rather abstract, more concretely, in terms more accessible to us, the Buddha says that Nibbana is the supreme happiness, paramang sukhan. It's the state of perfect health, free from the sickness of the mental defilement. It's perfect bliss, peace, serenity, liberation, freedom, emancipation, purity. All these terms signify qualities that we ordinarily desire and wish for. And all of these are found raised to a superlative degree in Nibbana. Then there are other terms which stress the uniqueness and profound nature of Nibbana. These terms tend to appeal to the intellectually inclined disciples rather than to the emotionally inclined ones. The Buddha says that Nibbana is the unique, something without a parallel among all other things. He says that it is the truth, the supreme truth. It's reality. It's the profound, the subtle, the difficult to see, the difficult to understand. It's the wonderful and the marvelous, a charyang abhutan. But when these positive terms are taken over to describe Nibbana, It should be understood that these terms are used in an expedient rather than in a literal manner. That is, though Nibbana is spoken of as peace, happiness, health, freedom, and so on, we shouldn't understand these terms to mean exactly the same thing that they mean in our ordinary mundane context. Rather, these terms are used as pointers, as road signs as expedient means to make Nibbana somewhat intelligible to us. They indicate, in terms of our ordinary experience, the direction in which we're to seek Nibbana. They indicate the qualities of common experience that are to be found in Nibbana, raised to a superlative pitch, carried to the ultimate limit. Nibbana is the pinnacle of happiness, peace, and freedom the ultimate consummation in which all of our yearnings for happiness, for peace, for freedom, find their complete fulfillment. Consummation in which all of our yearnings for happiness, for peace, for freedom, find their complete fulfillment. It's the goal that they point to as their own inherent tendency. Then further, the Buddha also makes use of poetic or metaphorical terms for Nibbana. For example, he calls Nibbana the island, the deep end. This is a very beautiful word. In one text in the Sutta Nibbana, he speaks of all living beings as being swept away by a tumultuous river, a fearsome flood which is sweeping them helplessly into the ocean of birth, old age and death. And all of these beings seek a place of safety and security, an island which they can land upon and be free from the suffering of birth and death. And so the Buddha calls Nibbana the island, the deeper, which provides safety and security from the dangers of samsara, from the ocean of becoming. The Buddha also calls Nibbana the cave. The cave is a place which gives safety from the threat of storms, wild beasts, robbers, and so on. And so Nibbana gives us safety from all the dangers of birth and death. Nibbana is called the cool state, the state that results, the coolness that results from the extinguishing of the fires of greed, hatred, and delusion. He calls Nibbana the shelter, the refuge, the further shore. 
The Buddha says that in our worldly life we are like a man in a hostile land, faced with all sorts of dangers. Wild beasts are running after him. He's being pursued by enemies with drawn swords. He's chased by thieves who are out to rob him. He runs and runs until he comes to the edge of a stream. He wants to get across to the other side where he can find safety. But he has no boat, so he builds a raft. He paddles his way across, and he reaches the safety of the other shore. Here in this parable, the near shore, the region where the man is stuck, that is a symbol for birth and death, filled with all the dangers, troubles, and suffering. The stream is the current of craving, the current of defilements that we have to cross. And the further shore, the destination, the place of safety, that is, Nibbana. Now the attainment of Nibbana comes in two stages. These two stages are spoken of as the two Nibbana elements, or two elements of Nibbana, Nibbana Dhatu. One is the Nibbana element with a residue remaining, the other is the Nibbana element without a residue remaining. The Nibbana element with a residue remaining in Pali, this is the Sa di Sesa Nibbana Dhatu. And this is the state of Nibbana which is attained in this present life by the Arahat, the liberated one. The Arahat has followed the path to its end, he's eradicated all the mental defilements, and he's attained Nibbana in this present life. The element of Nibbana which he realizes is called the Nibbana element with a residue remaining. Now what is the residue that is remaining? The residue is the set of five aggregates that constitute his present life individuality. At the moment of birth he acquired the compound of five aggregates that make up his psychophysical organism. These he grasped through his ignorance and craving from the past life. But in this present life, this person has reached liberation. He learned the Dharma from the Buddha, he practiced the path, brought it to fulfillment, and by bringing it to fulfillment, he extinguished all of his defilements. But with the extinguishing of the defilements, his individual being composed of the five aggregates doesn't come to an end immediately. His body and mind continue on to the end of the lifespan. The psychophysical organism that remains, this combination of the five aggregates, this is the residue that stays on in his attainment of Nibbana. Even while living in the state of perfect liberation of mind, the Arhat continues to perform the necessary functions of life. He doesn't simply enter into some unbroken trance and remain there until his death, but he goes about his daily activities. He goes to sleep at night, he wakes up in the morning, he eats, he goes to the bathroom, he talks, he performs his various duties, and so on. On the surface, he might seem very much like others. He doesn't wear a label that says, I'm an Arhant. But though he goes about his daily activities, he has completely uprooted and abolished all the defilements, greed, hatred, and delusion. He cannot perform any action of body, speech, or mind that springs from these defilements. And because the state of Nibbana is marked by the destruction of defilements, it is also called the Kilesa Pari Nibbana, the Nibbana that consists in the extinguishing of the defilements. And in this state of Nibbana, the five aggregates still stand. That is the residue that's remaining. But though they still stand, they no longer harbor the force that built them, the force that brought, brought them into being. That is the force of craving. The Buddha says that in the case of the Arhat, his five aggregates stand cut off at the root, Uchina Mula. The five aggregates of the ordinary being, these five aggregates contain craving. 
They contain the root or source of more becoming in the future, the root of existence, craving. But the aggregates of the arhat, those are cut off at the root. They are five purified aggregates. They're no longer clung to, no longer grasped and held to, no longer identified as being I, me, myself. And when they stand and function, they function just like a phonograph that has been turned off. When we turn off a phonograph, the turntable continues to revolve until it loses its momentum and comes to a stop. But even though it turns, there's no more electricity coming through to keep it revolving. Similarly, in the case of the Arahant, there's no more craving and no more clinging running through his mind, sustaining the process of becoming and leading it, leading it on to future existences. His five aggregates continue on to the end of his life, but the five aggregates stand cut off at the root. They no longer support the craving out of which they have arisen. To understand the experience of the Arha, the experience the experiential side of the Nibbana element with the residue remaining, we can look at it from three points of view according to the three basic aspects of human experience. The affective side, the side of feeling and emotion. The volitional side, the aspect of will. And the cognitive side, the aspect of knowledge and understanding. First, we'll look at it from the affective side. And from this angle, the experience of Nibbana is a state of complete happiness. It's a state which is utterly free from all mental suffering, from sorrow, grief, worry, and fear. It doesn't mean that the Arahant doesn't experience pain anymore. The Arahant can still feel pain with the body. If he makes contact with sharp or rough objects, he'll feel physical pain. But this pain doesn't disturb his mind in any way. It doesn't cause him annoyance, sorrow, anger, or fear. The Arhat's experience of Nibbana is not only a state of perfect happiness, but it's also a state of unshakable peace. This peace comes about through the stilling of all the defilements. The Buddha says that the defilements are fevers, vexations, disturbances. They cause trouble and anxiety in the mind. The unenlightened mind, the mind which still harbors the defilements, is always underlaid by a deep-rooted agitation, by a fundamental restlessness, by a basic lack of peace. Sometimes the mind is agitated about the past, worrying about things that have been done in the past. Sometimes it's worrying about things in the future, things that lie ahead. Sometimes it's worrying what's going on elsewhere in the present. But so often the mind is agitated, anxious, or worried. But with the abandoning of all forms of attachment, with the relinquishing of all craving and clinging, then there comes complete freedom from agitation, restlessness, and worry. That is Nibbana, the state of unruffled peace. Nibbana is also a state of complete fearlessness. All fear comes from the notion of a self, an ego. When we become afraid, what we're really afraid of is that something is going to happen to me, to myself, or to those things that I believe belong to me. And as long as there is this notion of an I, a self lurking in the background of the mind, then we remain vulnerable to fear and to worry. But when the notion of an ego has been uprooted and completely destroyed, that the sense of I-ness no longer hangs over our experience, then there comes liberation from all fear. Buddha says that there are two beings who cannot be frightened by the crashing of a thunderbolt. One is the elephant, the other is the arhat. 
the elephant isn't frightened because of his powerful body, also because of his small intelligence. But the arhant is not frightened because he is completely free from all self-attachment. Therefore, the Buddha calls Nibbana the state of complete security, Kemabhumi, or the supreme security from turmoil. And he also calls it the fearless state of fearlessness. Again, from the emotional angle, Nibbana can be viewed as a state of perfect equanimity. The Arhat looks upon all things with complete equality, with perfect balance of mind. He's no longer swayed by personal preferences. He no longer indulges in false distinctions and discriminations. The untrained mind is generally shaken by the changes of the world, what's called the eight worldly winds, which come in four pairs. These are gain and loss, fame and dishonor, praise and blame, pleasure and pain. Generally, we're attached to gain, fame, praise and pleasure, and we're distressed by loss, dishonor, blame and pain. But the mind of the Arhant is unshaken by all of these winds of worldly changes. His mind is steady like a mountain of solid rock, steady and unmoving. In all circumstances, the mind of the Arhant, the liberated one, is imperturbable. He doesn't go running after gain, honor, praise, and pleasure. He doesn't become upset if he meets loss, dishonor, blame, and pain. He looks upon all these different states as though they were the same. None of them gets an inner grip or a hold upon his mind. However, it has to be emphasized that this equanimity of the Arhat doesn't amount to indifference or apathy. It doesn't mean that the Arhat is unconcerned with the welfare of others. Sometimes in the later Buddhist literature, especially of the Mahayana, the Arhats have been depicted as cold and indifferent people, concerned only with their own salvation. This picture, however, doesn't agree with the impressions of the Arhat that we get from the Pali Canon. In the Pali text, the Buddha emphasizes again and again that the supreme person, the most praiseworthy person, is the one who is intent on both his own welfare and the welfare of others. The disciple, first of all, has to accomplish the goal for himself. Only when he's on, on, uh, on dry land by himself can he lift others out of the mud. Only when he's liberated himself can he effectively teach and guide others to liberation. But those who reach the goal, who achieve deliverance, they become the teachers and guides for their fellow men. The Buddha says that the arahants are living in the world for the welfare of the many folk, for the happiness of the many folk, out of compassion for the world, for the good welfare and happiness of all living beings. He says that the Arhans are instructors, exhorters, who exhort, inspire, and encourage others who are capable of expounding the true Dhamma. He says that it is beneficial even to see such persons, to approach them, to serve them, to call them to mind, to study under them and to practice under them. He says that the Arhans are the masters, the caravan leaders, the purifiers, the dispellers of darkness, the creators of light, the torchbearers, the sons of illumination for all the world. The Arhat's mind is stirred by immeasurable loving kindness and boundless compassion. He pervades all the world with thoughts of loving kindness, thinking, may all beings be well and happy. And he radiates thoughts of compassion, wishing that all beings might be free from suffering, from all harm and trouble. Now this deals with the experience of Nibbana in terms of feeling and emotion. Now to deal with it in terms of will or volition. In our ordinary experience, the will is held in bondage by the defilement. We move and act in the grip of the defilement, and therefore we're driven to act in ways which we know to be harmful even to our own welfare under the 
sway of greed, hatred, delusion, and fear, we act even contrary to our own best interests. Because of our greed and desire, we chase after transitory pleasures, even though we know that in the long run these will have disastrous consequences. We give rise to anger and hatred which destroy our inner calm and which disrupt our personal relationships. We're held in the chains of greed, anger, conceit, worry, jealousy, and so on. But the Arhat's mind is totally free, even from the smallest trace of these bonds. He enjoys complete inner autonomy. He lives as master of himself. He has sovereignty over all the workings of his mind. His mind can no longer be dominated, gripped, and compelled by unwholesome motives. And therefore, he never acts in any ways destructive to his own welfare or to the welfare of others, but always in ways which are beneficial, which serve the good of others as well as his own good. The Buddha compares the arhant to a lotus flower. The lotus flower is unstained by all the mud in the pond in which it grows. Even when the muddy water touches it, it immediately falls off the petals without sticking or adhering to the petals. So in the same way, the mind of the arhant, when it makes contact with sensory phenomena, when it undergoes, when the arhant goes through different experiences, his mind is unstained by the defilement, by greed, hatred, and delusion, but all these worldly phenomena just immediately they just slip through without giving rise to any defiled motivation. Now the volitions of the unenlightened person bring about karma. For the unenlightened person, every willed action deposits a seed in the mind with the tendency to produce results, to bring about happiness or suffering in the future, to ripen in a form of future rebirth. The Arhant, however, has broken free entirely from the cycle of actions and reactions. He still performs volitional actions, but these acts of his are the great exception to the rule that all volitional actions are karma. The Arhant's acts, as we've said, are not karma. They are mere activities, kriyamata, activities that take place without leaving any trace on the mind of the Arhant. His acts are trackless, like the flight of birds across the sky. The Arhat still reaps the results of his old commas performed through his many past lives. He still meets with the pleasant and painful fruits of those actions. But these don't disturb him in any way. They don't upset or stir his mind. He doesn't react to them in terms of the Distinctive patterns that have been built up through the defilement, but he observes them with perfect mindfulness and clear comprehension. Thus, he's cut off all the chains of suffering. Then, thirdly, the experience of Nibbana can be considered in terms of knowledge or understanding. We find that the Arhant enjoys perfect understanding, complete realization. His mind is the awakened mind, the enlightened mind, the mind that has been illuminated by the knowledge of things as they truly are. He is no longer misled by the distortions, the projections, the perversions, but he understands and sees all conditioned phenomena as impermanent, unsatisfactory, without any ego reference. His state of mind is one of full wisdom, full comprehension. It's the meaning of sambodhi, enlightenment. Okay, so this deals with the arhat's experience of the nibbana element with the residue remaining. His living experience, which is a state of perfect happiness, complete peace, complete inner freedom, and full awakening and understanding. Now, the second stage in the attainment of Nibbana is called the Nibbana element without a residue remaining. Anupadisesa Nibbana doctrine. This 
is the element of Nibbana that is attained by the Arhant with his passing away, with the breakup of the body, what we conventionally call death. But in the case of the Arhant, the Buddha does not use the word death. This word applies to ordinary beings, not to the Arhant. The notion death is connected with birth. It's an event a phase that takes place in the round of becoming, the round of birth and death. And the notion of death has its basis in the conception of a self who dies. It's valid only insofar as there is still the notion of a self in the mind. But the passing away of the arhant is a final and complete passing away from conditioned existence. It doesn't lead to a new birth And subjectively, it isn't conceived as the death of myself. In his own experience of death, the Arhat sees only the cessation of a process, not the death of a self. The experience for him is without any subjective reference, any reference to me or mine. The Nibbana attained by the Arhat with his passing away is the Nibbana element without residue remaining. And it receives this designation because when it's attained, the residue of the five aggregates comes to an end. Now, for an unenlightened being, when death takes place, his craving and karma reconstitute the process of the five aggregates with a new physical basis. As a result, rebirth occurs and the flux of becoming goes on. New death followed by more. New birth followed by more aging and death. But with the passing away of the Arhan, there is no more rebirth. His mind has been freed from craving and clinging, and all his old karma built up from the beginningless past becomes defunct, becomes ineffective. Since the Arhan doesn't come to any more physical existence, he provides his karma with no more basis by which it can ripen. And thus, with the passing away of the Arhant, the process of the five aggregates, the beginningless process of becoming, comes to an end. It draws to a close. And therefore, this attainment of the Nibbana element without residue is also called the Kandapari Nibbana, Nibbana consisting in the extinguishing of the process of the five aggregates. Now the question often comes up, what is the state of the arhat after death? Is it a state of annihilation or non-existence or a state of eternal existence in some form? The Buddha rejects both of these alternatives. He says that any answer, any attempt to answer this question is inapplicable invalid. The question, what is the state of the arhat after death, arises because of an intellectual clinging, a subtle clinging to the idea that the arhat has a self which must become either eternalized or annihilated. But since the arhat or any other being for that manner cannot be conceived as a self, the state of the arhat and final nibbana cannot be conceived as either eternal existence or as annihilation. The Arhat doesn't enter into some state of eternal existence, either as an individual self in some heavenly world or as a universal self in some impersonalized form. But also, final Nibbana is not a state of annihilation, for there is no self to be annihilated and extinguished. What we call the arhat is a dependently arisen process of becoming, and the attainment of final nibbana is a cessation to that beginningless process of becoming. To try to speak of what lies beyond the ending of this process, this is to venture outside the boundaries of conceptualization, outside the boundaries of language, There's a sutta, the 15th sutta of the Diga Nikaya, in which the Buddha says, 
In so far only is there any pathway for words, any pathway for language, any pathway for concepts, any sphere of understanding. That is, when there is consciousness together with mind and body process, nama rupa and vijnana. When there is no remainder of consciousness with the mind-body process, then there is no pathway for words, no pathway for language, no pathway for concepts. So from this we can see that when the five aggregates, the mind-body process sees, then there's no room for language, concepts, or knowledge, nothing to point to and to designate. Here, words become totally inadequate and unsatisfactory. The concepts can't penetrate the inconceivable, and the mind can't measure the immeasurable. There are three, there are a few interesting sutta passages that, in which the question of the state of the arhat after death is raised. In one sutta, the 72nd sutta of the Majjhima Nikaya, the wandering ascetic, a non-Buddhist, named Vachagota comes to the Buddha and he asks, he says, Venerable Sir, does the enlightened one, the liberated one, the Arhant, does he exist after death? The Buddha says, to say he exists after death, that doesn't apply then the, the, the wanderer asks, then does he not exist after death? The Buddha says non-existence doesn't apply. The wanderer tries the combination. Does he both exist and not exist after death? The Buddha says that doesn't apply. Then he tries the double negation. Does he neither exist nor non-exist after death? The Buddha says to say he neither exists nor non-exist after death. That doesn't apply. Though so the Buddha rejects all these four alternatives, the wanderer says, I'm puzzled. I don't understand. Then the Buddha uses an analogy. He says, suppose there's a fire. The fire burns and blazes in dependence upon its fuel, upon the sticks and logs. Now, if the fire doesn't get any further fuel when it uses up the old fuel, then it goes out. Suppose we ask, when the fire goes out, where does it go? Does it go to the north, to the south, to the east, to the west? The wanderer says, none of these apply. All of these are inapplicable. The fire has simply gone out. The Buddha says, it's the same way with the arahant. The dependently arisen process of becoming has come to an end. However, in case the idea that the final Nibbana is a state of non-existence comes to the mind. The Buddha dispels us with what he says further. He says that the liberated one, the Tathagata, freed from reckoning by way of the five aggregates, by way of form, feelings, the perceptions, the mental formations and consciousness. The Tathagata is deep, immeasurable, and un fathomable like the great ocean, not to be conceived by the finite concepts of the mind, not to be measured by the measuring devices of the mind. There's another similar sutta which is spoken by a nun, a bhikkhuni, named Kema. Kema comes to see King Basena de Kosala, the king of the state of Kosala. And King Basenadi asked the same questions about the state of the Tathagata after death. And to each of these, the nun Kema says, that is not declared by the Buddha. The Buddha doesn't say that the Arhat exists eternally after death, that he becomes non-existent, that both he both exists and doesn't exist, that he neither doesn't exist nor non-exists after death. The king is puzzled and asks for an explanation. The Bhikkhuni Kema says, Do you have, O Majesty, do you have a minister, a treasurer, or an accountant who is able to measure the waters in the ocean, 
say that there's so much water in the ocean? King says, no, I don't. And so in the same way, Bhikkhuni says, the Tathagata, the enlightened one, free from reckoning by way of the five aggregates, is like the great ocean, deep, immeasurable, and unfathomable. Then there's one very beautiful sutta in the collection, the Sutta Nipata, called the Parayana. And in this, an inquiring Brahman comes to the Buddha and asks him about the state of the liberated one in final Nibbana. The Buddha replies in verse, he says, Just as a flame flung into the wind flies to its end and no more comes into the range of conceiving, so the sage released from name and form, from mind and body, reaches the end, the final goal, and no more comes into the range of concepts. Then the inquirer asks, Does he who has reached the goal become non-existent, or does he exist eternally in a state of everlasting bliss? Answer this question for me, O wise one, for you are the one who has understood the truth. Then the Buddha answers. He says, There is no way to measure the man who has reached the goal. That by which we can speak of him, that does not exist for him. When all dhammas, that is, when all the states of mind and body and the five aggregates, when all dhammas have been removed, then all the pathways of speech have been removed. And since all the pathways of speech have been removed, at this point the lecture will come to an end.